let's jump in. Let me first thank you all for, for making the time to uh, come together and tell us more about this collaboration and this article. Um, can, can I start by doing a quick loop around and getting you to introduce yourselves and your work? Um, I might just call on you in the audio on my screen. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Esti, you're up. All right. Uh, Esti Beck, I'm the director of the Merit Writing Program at the University of California, Merced. And my work in rhetoric and composition is more aligned with the subfield of computers and writing. And I look at surveillance and privacy practices. So I am pro-privacy, anti-surveillance in um, social media, in um, any course management space, LMS space. Um, and I want students to be aware of how much information companies track uh, about them online. Awesome. Uh, Mariana. Sure. Yeah. I'm Mariana Grahowski. Um, I want to start off by saying I love where I live. And to me, location is more important than vocation. Um, so I also will say that I founded and edited a peer reviewed international open access journal. And I also founded and run a scholarly society. So for the last almost a decade, I've um, been working to try to establish a new academic discipline um, of veteran studies, um, not alone in that effort, but that's mm -hmm. primarily been my work. Um, and I'm currently working on trying to compensate folks who do editorial work um, in a equitable manner. Awesome. All right, and Christine. Oh, thank you. Um, Chris Blair, I work at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I'm the Dean of the McNulty College and Graduate School of Liberal Arts. I would also like um, Esty identify as a computers and writing um, specialist with a particular focus on um, techno-feminist um, rhetorics. And so by techno-feminist, I mean using a, a feminist framework to um, tease out the lived experiences that diverse cultural groups have with technologies of literacy and understanding that those experiences are frequently mediated by inequitable systems of difference. Mm -hmm. Cool. So when I wrote to you all, um, Chris wrote back to me and said, um, this article was truly a collaborative effort that triangulated our respective expertise and passions. And I think we can see that just in hearing you, you all's introductions. Um, we're doing a big collaborative writing, a team writing project in our class at the moment. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the origin and the process of this collaboration. Mm -hmm. I would credit Esty for bringing it up um, as a suggestion, if I'm correct. Uh, we were traveling to a conference together that we were presenting at and um, she said ah, there's this call for papers and I think that you know I want to contribute is that great is that is that how it is that started? is that how it started I thought so I thought we were sitting eating salads or lunch or something at Maybe a it was. The service area Chris is oh, my right how do you yeah <laughs> I just remember that somehow we saw this call and yes went, Wowza. And I don't know if you saw it with me or without me, but somehow I got looped in and I was like, yay, let's, let's do this. Um, and so I was really excited about it because at the time it was meant when you look at it online now, it's very um, sort of static, um, alphabetic text, but at the time it was really meant to be very multimodal. And I'm sure at some point mm -hmm. we could talk about that as part of the collaborative process too. Um, so it was an exciting time to bring together the research end of it, but also to really pool our time and, and design skills to design um, a, a website that would represent this document that ultimately not ended up not living on the University of Michigan's um, site, but still was really um, fun if albeit time consuming. <laughs> Like every digital project. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and it was, uh, we did a really good job on that design. It was really beautiful. It was a thing of beauty. Yeah, I remember working in, you know, various spaces together to try to create this and, you know, working in the graduate computer lab, for example, you know, Chris would come in and, um, you know, <laughs> work with us and try to get that work done. And, you know, we were very good about, 
uh, delegating tasks and time keeping on a timeline. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that was really lovely about making the collaborative work uh, mm -hmm. approachable. But I also want to like say that we both, you know, SC and I had both sought out Chris for independent studies to do techno feminist work. Mm -hmm. So I would also just like to put out that we both had that interest, that shared interest of doing techno feminist work and which Chris has expertise in. And I think mm -hmm. that's important. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But do you have specific questions about sort of like the pragmatics of the collaboration or I guess? Oh, I didn't put anything specific in. I think um, the reason that I uh, tacked it on there is because I kind of always like to hear, to be able to share folks' reactions to collaborative work and to be able to hear those kind of like enthusiastic stories. A lot of, a lot mm -hmm. of folks, um, you know, like I love co-authoring. I've, I've had a lot of great experiences, but I know it can feel a little bit scary. And it's one of the things we've been talking about in. Mm -hmm. in class as well and since you raised it I thought I would just mm -hmm. see what you all had to say yeah mm -hmm. there's a lot of there's a lot of um trust and control issues involved with collaboration and really you know and I've gotten better at this um I think over the years but you know you, there sometimes you can you have to really let people do their part and do their thing and, mm -hmm. and trust that um they that it'll all come together and so um this is one of several collaborations I've had with um both SB and Mayor and you know um that that trust was certainly there from from the get-go in part because of you know their phenomenal expertise and and their passion for this work oh I would say that the the trust was really I, I think it beyond expertise it's just the trust in just the relationships that we all have with each other and just um, having a groundwork and understanding how I think this is important about collaboration is you really have to know how other people work you have to understand what their expectations are for work and because both Mary and I had worked with Chris in the independent studies and in other graduate courses we had a really good sense of the way that Chris operated her expectations mm -hmm. we understood um, that as graduate students at that time that it was also a, a professionalization task that Chris was mentoring us through a process. And we learned I, a great deal from um, how to engage in that collaborative space. But in, in the subsequent collaborative projects that I've been in, I would say the number one area that I always look for is that sense of, do I understand how what somebody else is going to bring to the table and how they're going to work? Are they someone who procrastinates? Are they someone who likes to get work done early? Are they someone who asks a lot of questions? They need a lot mm -hmm. of check-in. And it, it helps me to also set my parameters and boundaries around the work that I contribute to a project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. All right, let's keep going. Um, so this, this question comes directly from one of the students. So thinking about the power imbalance between teachers and students in virtual learning spaces, what do you think the ideal balance is? Is it preferable that it's completely equal or that the students have a little bit more power and agency than teachers do? Like, What can you imagine your ideal setup looking like? Mm -hmm. I see Vera's reaction over there. <laughs> I'm desperate to hear what both Chris and Esty think. Uh, they have more expertise in, on this than I do, but I'll just share that. Um, and I probably, this is all I feel like I can share at this time. I haven't really worked in uh, this space in a few years now. Um, but I'll, I'll, so all I'll say is, you know, we tried to talk about this in the chapter, uh, you know, um, I'm looking particularly at the section joining forces gaining ground and, you know, looking back at the time of writing, I, I was really struggling with this, you know, and we obviously grappled with that in the chapter and, um, you know, I shared the anecdote of when I was trying to provide more, for, uh, more student uh, collaboration or contribution, I was really getting resistance of like, no, 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 I don't want to. Um, so I, you know, I don't know what it would be like today. So I'll just say that I'm really looking forward to hearing what my uh, co-authors have to say about this. I mean, your honesty. <laughs> I, I would, you know what, I really, I will say as far as virtual learning spaces go, I, I really do not like using Canvas, Blackboard. Ever since writing this piece, 
um, I have been uh, vocal to colleagues about the problems with the interfaces. And I have used other spaces such as Slack. I've used uh, Google Docs, for example, Google Drive. Uh, I've even defaulted just to email exchanges because I, I really don't like that the LMSs have um, a high degree of analytics and the space is not designed for students. It's designed for teachers and administrators. And if a student comes into a classroom and teachers and educators say, we are student-centered, then we need the tools to be student-centered. And I think that, that Canvas and Blackboard and other LMSs aren't, aren't quite there yet in, in student-centered um, ways that would match and mirror pedagogy and practices. I think that it's tied to um, a mentor of mine in, in the field often would say, in order to have power, you have to share power. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really look at, look at it as a power sharing model. So that means that an instructor doesn't give up all of their um, authority in, in a classroom, but they create, they create spaces virtually that enable um, students to, to share in that empowerment process. So I, I really am sort of like SD and then, um, I, and also like Naren that I haven't taught a course in a number of years given my Dean role, um, but, but I, I gave up on Blackboard um, at many and Canvas many years ago and taught classes and never used them. And I had some students that were not happy with me about that because Blackboard was sort of in use at a particular university or Canvas. It was the sanctioned LMS. Mm -hmm. Students knew where to go for information. Um, I never precluded students from using Blackboard when they wanted to facilitate discussion. And even though I kind of would have this secret, secret little grumble, grumble, they're using Blackboard, Blackboard sucks. Um, you know, I, I accepted that. And, and I always tried to ground it, I think, in terms of what the rhetorical affordances are of, of any tool for presentation, publication, dialogue, et cetera. And so I ended up turning over a lot of the class, at least part of a class, to students um, at both the graduate and undergraduate level and letting them um, experiment, play. Um, most of the times those were those were pretty good. Um, sometimes they were disasters and own, own the disaster, own the failure, you know, and I think that that's part of the beauty of, of teaching, you know, and there's no one way to do it right. You try and some things don't work. And you learn from that as well, right? Like, yep. Yep. yeah, mm -hmm. it's one class out of how many? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a thread in there about the difference between authority and power um, and the ways that teachers can maintain authority um, within, uh, yeah, maintain some of their authority within their spaces to help facilitate uh, learning experiences. Um, so the student asked about, like, what happens if things get, like, completely out of control? Is the answer just, like, learn from it? Is there a point at which you think um, there needs to be an intervention made to get things back on track? Kind of invoke this figure of students just running wild and the course collapsing. I, I think you have to acknowledge that something has gone wrong. Um, mm -hmm. And you can do that in the moment itself. You can do that after it's happened. You can acknowledge your own complicity in the in the failure of the moment. I, having done that with a number of classes and the pain that and the embarrassment, if you will, of when things go south. Um, but but it's really important because I think that. I don't want to say that students are very forgiving, um, but I think in some cases, if you honestly, earnestly um, acknowledge that this did not go well, and let's talk about why that happened, and let's some, set some ground rule, rules that this doesn't happen again, um, they I, I like to think that they respect that and will in turn um, allow allow for that moment to fit to a failure on everybody's part or even on a couple individuals' parts to be um, a growing opportunity 
be. And, and if not, I always thought the best way to get revenge on situations like that was to write about it. So I've always said that my entire career was based on all of my pedagogical failures. Um, anytime something went wrong in my class, I'd go, let's write about that. <laughs> a couple of those myself <laughs> yeah yeah so I've had a lot of pedagogical failures I, I I really I agree it really resonates with what Chris is saying because there have been so many times where I've tried new technology or, or just even new teaching methods or um, something in the classroom and then it, it just it fails for any number of reasons and um, in that moment I think it's so important to acknowledge uh, the failure and acknowledge why it happened. And um, like Chris said, set some ground rules. I've certainly had my time in the classroom where I've integrated tech. And I, for example, maybe didn't realize I had assumptions about how much students would be able to navigate the technology because I'm thinking it, that, that students, this is my assumption, have more of an intuitive sense on how to use technology um, and, and not really realizing how much I needed to scaffold teaching how to use specific tools within the tech. Uh, and so um, throughout trial and error, I've learned how to create some balances and checks and balances in teaching technology to students. But I, at the end of the day, I think that any failure is a, a great moment to acknowledge and then also to reflect upon it. And like Chris, I've also written about my failures in teaching also, and I think they're, they're wonderful to learn from. Is the only thing I feel like I can add here is um, just troubling this slightly. Uh, I worked at an institution where authoritative, authoritative culture was um, part and parcel to the pedagogy, the administration. Um, and so me trying to embody this authoritative role uh, in the classroom was extremely challenging as, uh, as a feminist, a uh, very staunch feminist. And so um, I'll just say too that um, sometimes honoring and owning that authoritative pose, um, if it's part of the institutional culture, um, I don't know, I just wanted to add that piece there to say that, um, it, it maybe this matters depending on the institutional culture in which the person works and, and the pedagogical practices are happening. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you're going to work within like the rhetorical situation that you have, you know, it's all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Owning the power uh, <laughs> when that is the sort of modus operandi of the culture. I don't know. It's interesting. I mean, troubling that definitely is what this chapter is asking, right? We got to trouble those spaces and make space and ask and encourage our students to do the same. And, you know, uh, it can just be challenging if you are in an authoritative culture um, or institution. So, yeah. yeah. Ms. Marina, you talked about, um, yeah, encouraging students to challenge, um, yeah, to challenge these structures. The article mostly addresses educators and students often get left out of discussions about things like this, um, you know, often at a classroom level, certainly at a uh, policy level. Um, so they might feel stuck despite being, you know, aware of these kinds of issues. Um, what advice do you have for students who are looking to advocate for themselves and their peers and intervene in trying to have more equitable pedagogies, more equitable platforms? Well, I would really say um, know your audience, number one, know, know who you're going to be asking the questions to and frame it as being open and curious, frame it as um, um, inviting a discussion and, and just make sure that the, the, the faculty member administrator that you're talking to is going to be receptive to um, the conversation. Uh, other than that, definitely, um, Coming with an informed position is also helpful. And then um, I would say even pitching a solution to the, the problem is also beneficial. Yeah. It's a great question because I think, unfortunately, undergraduates don't um, know um, how to push back in ways that are constructive in, in the way that SD is is suggesting and and to do so in a way that um, 
is challenging, but not necessarily critical, um, you know, and understanding the difference between the two, um, because it's all that, it's that gap between intention and perception, right? What I, what you intend to uh, do is to ask for some sort of alternative or different point of entry into the assignment um, or whatever the activity is. And, and some faculty might hear that as you're telling me, I don't know what I'm doing or I suck yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, and it really, you know, it's really hard not to, um, for some faculty to take that personally. And so to really sort of look for ways to, for students to look for ways to have those meaningful conversations about, well, I really like to approach the assignment this way. Um, and, and, and maybe to ask those, I mean, in some ways, individual conversations are good, but I think sometimes as faculty, um, you know, as instructors introduce assignments, that's really the point to ask some critical questions. Well, um, you know, about, about the genres, the modalities, the approaches, that will be more or or less viable. And, you know, I know that I'm not answering your question by making this point, but but I also think that faculty have to signal their openness to that. Yes. And that's what I think SD is getting at. Some mm -hmm. of it is being um, approachable and, and all of that. Um, but the other thing is to signal it in the assignments themselves and in the syllabus, um, because it gets back to that notion of rhetorical composing. Um, I'm May envision that the best way to respond to this assignment is through an essay or through, um, you know, uh, a visual response, but there might be other ways to respond to that, a podcast, um, a, a film, and, and really, you know, allowing for that, um, you know, that possibility that some students wouldn't even know to ask about if mm -hmm. you didn't pose it as an option. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with everything. Um, I would just also say, um, with all of the things that Chris and SD have said, as well as a caveat to add to, just an addendum to you know to the student, um, you know, know what you need. Uh, you know, some of us don't always know what we need, right? Chris said, mm -hmm. Chris said, you know, uh, I want to compose it in this way, but she, like she said if I don't know to ask that question, or I don't know mm -hmm. that those are alternatives because my, you know, professors or anyone has never kind of given me that awareness. Um, mm -hmm. That's so super crucial, right? I mean, maybe yeah. there were things that I could have asked for, but I, I didn't know what I needed. Um, so this is, yeah, many multifaceted. It's very yeah. exciting. Putting it out there is always such an equity issue as well, because like some students will have been prepared to ask for those things um, yes. over their entire careers and others will never have had it presented as even the biggest option. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so this article was published in 2017. So I'm guessing it was like 2015-ish working on it. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously a fair bit has changed, especially in the last two years or so. Um, what, uh, looking back at it now, what do you think uh, the biggest changes in, um, I guess, the discussion surrounding LMSs? Is? is there anything that you would add to or change to if you are writing this now? <laughs> <laughs> what a question, I'm, Brad. I'm, I'm, I'm laughing a bit because I, I think that there's still more work to be done. There's there from the, the perspective of surveillance culture in, in higher ed, it's it's you know coded in terms of analytics. Everybody likes to see the analytics, they like to see the data. And, you know, I just learned, for example, um, at, in California, community colleges. Um, not only do they track student um, analytics, but they track faculty analytics as, as part of, and they actually send out emails like, oh, congratulations, you sent out 20 emails to your students, or, or congratulations, you're, you're doing great and uh, responding to student concerns in a timely manner. And I, that kind of culture um, it can be very oppressive, it can, it can be damaging for trust, and 
Uh, there are too many tools coming out in higher ed that are promoting the analytics. And uh, what the, the problem with that is how faculty and administrators then respond to that data and how they use that data and in ways that may not be authentic to what the student, what their intent was in using the tool. And, and so I think there, there actually still needs to be more, more ground covered, more activism, not only within journals, but within, I would say like higher ed, general publications, or maybe even more public spaces awareness of this, because of course it's being filtered down into, um, it, this isn't just a, a higher ed problem. It is um, just uh, education in general. Yeah. yeah. And remote work as well, right? We saw that. Well, we've seen that for decades, but yeah, has also intensified. Mm -hmm. mm. Chris, you're gonna. <laughs> Oh yeah, I can I can add something. <laughs> no, I was actually waiting for Mayor to add something. I didn't, I didn't want to, you know, we're we're kind of doing this ping pong yeah, thing. <laughs> I, just, I didn't want to overly ping or overly prong or whatever it is. Um, you know, Esty raises a really good point because I've experienced that as a dean. Um, so with COVID, everybody went online in about a week and a half, and some people had never used Blackboard because they weren't sanctioned to do so people certainly hadn't used zoom and so i mean it, you know we were just like you know let's get you up to speed a little bit okay go fly be free and um some of that didn't go so well um but what really didn't go so well was the idea among students and parents that if you weren't teaching synchronously you weren't teaching Mm -hmm. uh, because we did have a number of asynchronous courses. And, and so what ended up happening is that, you know, as the university was trying to defend that, hey, this course had been taught and your, your student was in the course and they got a B. And so what are you saying that, you know, they didn't, ha they didn't get a course. And you look at all the class action lawsuits at a lot of schools around the country that, you know, the online experience was awful and, and so forth. But there was a lot of faculty surveillance, um, not always, again, Against the faculty, but literally just to make a case of like, look, you know, your faculty member was in fact in this course and sending out announcements or using the discussion board or whatever. So it really was insidious um, just how much of that occurred. And I, that shocked me. I guess I, yeah, I was really naive about um, the legit, legit litigious nature of parents um you know and students but guess what so I do think that those are our issues I think the other issue is um the real emphasis on um accessibility and and understanding that for students and for faculty um accessing these spaces was really problematic. So I alluded to the faculty who didn't know how to do that. And we were like doing triage with some of them. Sometimes we had all these little mini workshops, how do you zoom, how to create a discussion board. And I was kind of like, really but that's a different story um but with students they had like you know veterans who had no place to go they had to go stay with their aunt because their aunt had an internet connection and and things like that so really understanding that people you know this automatic presumption of access on the part of students or or faculty is really not um as prevalent as we may think and we really have to understand that there are many ways to teach, there are many ways to learn, and to really approach that um, in, in an ecumenical sort of way, uh, at least during COVID, and I would say beyond, how do we learn from that COVID moment where it was just, you know, it was kind of a mess. And it was kind of a good mess in some ways, um, because I think now we have more faculty that are like, oh, I can, I can do this. I can, I can integrate a Zoom discussion. I can create breakout rooms, um, you know? And so that part of it is really promising. And as a Dean, I'm always like, yay, let's create more <laughs> online. Let's create more online programs to um, diversify our, mm -hmm. our recruitment and admittedly our revenue because I have to wear that hat now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I feel like I'm the most out of touch with this at this point. So I, I don't really feel like I have anything that I can contribute other than the saying, I'm, I'm sure Chris and SD are cracked in this face. I, I haven't, I was lucky, I guess I was fortunate enough that I didn't have to be teaching um, during COVID times. Um, but I think I'd say I'm more fortunate that I wasn't a student during those times, as Chris mentioned, for some of those reasons. And um, so I feel like I don't have much to add. Uh, yeah, I think it would have been like I, I my, my last job before this one was like 90% online. And so I was like, oh, okay, this is fine. We'll just like do the thing. But um, yeah, I really feel for everyone thrown into that circumstance without mm -hmm. choosing it. Mm -hmm. Well, and the other thing, like Esty said, the idea that um, you have to use certain tools mm -hmm. because I feel like, you know, at least at the institutions I've worked at, I've had a lot of flexibility to not use certain tools, mm -hmm. um, but I know that other institutions do not afford their faculty that luxury. Sometimes it's in the context of a collective bargaining agreement. You will use Blackboard. Um, you will, you know. So, and and I think it gets back to some of those surveillance issues. Um, and also, admittedly, um, the customer service issues of, of learning management systems, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for us here, it's a uniformity thing. The real push is for fewer, larger classes across all of our, um, yeah, across all of our de degree programs. So we don't have like those small 20 person uh, composition classes that you all do. I've got, mm -hmm. I think, 60 in this one class, oh, uh, 350 in one of my undergrad classes, in that lecture tutorial mode. Um, yeah, 12 classes in the writing major overall. So it's all about those kind of like, big uniform experiences um, mm. as framed as an equity uh, issue. Do so, you have assistance with that work? Do you have like TAs or? I have TAs for my undergrad classes. Yeah. Um, for the grad class, it's um, this, this semester I've got someone else in the room for my on-campus class because it went over 30. Um, yeah, and then the the online version is uh, just me on Zoom, seven o'clock at night, blank squares because everyone's got like kids running around in the background. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, that exact intersection of um, yeah people's lives and the technology and the institutional mm -hmm. location, the policies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So last question here. Um, uh, it says. What are you all working on at the moment? What can we look out for from you in the future? Mayor's got a journal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I've got a journal. Um, you can find that online, hopefully. Um, it's international, so I hope you can. Uh, we have Australian uh, uh, contributors. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what else can you look for me from in the future? Um, Hopefully more, uh, hopefully more. Um, I, I'll just be honest with your students um, that, you know, I've been working more on my uh, personal and mental health needs um, and challenges. Um, and therefore scholarship has not been, um, my own scholarship hasn't been the primary, other people's scholarship has been my primary uh, work, but I'm hoping that perhaps my own work will be coming in 2022. Uh, I will say I have an edited collection coming out um, in uh, probably 2023, um, more related to the veteran studies work that I do, but hoping to start working more on um, uh, accessibility issues, which is something that I was passionate about at the dissertation stage as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, for me, it's um, I have a, a revise and resubmit on an article. Um, it, it's kind of calling um, attention to the fact that in rec comp, the, the research, um, while there is research on surveillance and privacy, um, it's not well cited and it's not well engaged. And we have not done enough work to um, critique and examine surveillance culture in our spaces, especially writing spaces. And that in turn has affected um, digital literacy in ways that um, I think have, have been damaging. So um, hopefully I'll get an acceptance. I'm just waiting on the reviewer reports for the, the second round. And so th hopefully that will be forthcoming. 
I'm working on a chapter that I have a first draft on, which I'm really happy about that, on um, techno-feminist um, editorial mentoring um, through um, the journals that I've edited for a number of years now, Computers and Composition. Uh, and I, I'm really happy that I have a first version, but it's a really bad first version. But fortunately, the final version is not due until um, Halloween. Um, but it is um, for this collection on um, feminism and scholarly publishing um so gendering scholarly publishing so really talking about how some of the structures of um traditional the academy and english departments really prohibit um still despite our best efforts um more um diverse digital scholarship and um how you know and how despite again that, that hasn't really changed so i actually talk about the chair has anyone seen the chair on netflix yes. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, Very good. I, I mean, there's so many. That's just like the microcosm, you know, of of you know larger institutional structures uh, for facing women and um, individuals of of color mm -hmm. and other um, diverse identity categories. And so I just, you know, it sort of fit. And and now I have to go back and really make it fit. Uh, it's <laughs> Not a cool it's not just a cool anecdote to begin and end a chapter with i really have to do some weed um but but i'm getting there i'm getting there awesome wonderful well we'll look forward to seeing all of that awesome stuff um yeah let me thank you all again i really appreciate you taking the time uh sharing your insight i had a really fun time talking to you all as well it's great to um oh, have this opportunity fun. um and i know my students are going to love it as well when i give it to them on monday so awesome Thank you so much for this thank opportunity. It was yeah. great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Good luck with your class. Good luck with your work. Um, it was so great to see you too. Um, <laughs> take care. Let's not make this the last time we talk to each other for a year. <laughs> Glad I could facilitate a reunion as well. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. All right. Oops. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. No, I was just gonna say, I'm glad I saw a dog, um, a doggy, because I, you know, I had to lock my kitty up for a couple other meetings today, and I was finally like, I can't, I have to let her out. Um, I was saying to Esty that I had to, I had to lock them in today because they went ballistic in the next room uh, yesterday morning before seven o'clock. <laughs> Sorry, neighbors, it's happening, can't do anything, we're recording, it's just, <laughs> yeah, so I have my COVID refugee lap poodle here helping out. Yes. All right. Okay. So let's uh, let's jump.